<laughs> Here I am with Jamison Farn. We know Jamison from previous interviews. He runs the uh, Experience the Riviera website, which is principally targeted to gay men and their uh, experience on the Riviera, which is great. Uh, he's yeah. successful it's, and uh, it's great to see you, Jamison. It's good to see you too. It's been a while. I called you Jamison. I said, Jameson, Jameson. I must remember that. I, I have a typical tendency to say Jamison. I have no idea why. But there you go. I do apologize. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems that apart from the his busy life uh, with villa rentals and taking care of clients, he's found time to write a book, a second book. And this one is called Bathhouse Babylon. Mm -hmm. New yes. release. Oh, full release, full release, that's it. Yeah, full release. Yeah, and it's available on Amazon, so we'll cover that base, and we'll let, give you links later. But first off, let's find out, what is a bathhouse anyway? Well, um, they've been around for hundreds of years. Of course, they've changed over time, like since the Roman days. Oh. So, And they changed even every five to 10 years, the kind of demographic, uh, the technology helps enhance these places. They're basically venues for gay men or bisexual men, or a lot of straight men go to, to uh, visit and generally have sex or not, it's up to them. So these places are usually packed. They're a very social gathering. They're thought of as a place for men to get away from work or life in general, kind of like Vegas type thing. You know, what you do there, nobody's going to know, you know, that kind of thing. So, or if they decide to tell people or people see whatever, you know, so they're usually quite large venues. Large venues? Why, why is that? Um, because at the time, well, it depends on when they were built or the business had started, but they're used as like uh, places for men to cruise. Um, you pay a fee to go inside. It depends on what time of day or what you're doing. And it depends on what city you're in around the world and stuff like that. Um, in North America, you can rent a locker or a room. So the locker would look like a in a fitness center, that kind of thing. And everybody walks around with just a towel on around their waist or they're nude. So you can't really tell people's financial backgrounds or, you know, nationality even gets blurred because there will be so many men in the place. The lights are very dimly lit. There's nightclub music generally playing. It's a very sexually charged atmosphere, but there's never a pressure to do anything if you don't want to. A lot of men even just go to just get away. They'll even watch some movie in a TV lounge or whatever, but there's also all kinds of porn that is played and porn stars will even show up and do shows, that kind of thing. So really, yeah, I used to organize that kind of thing. <laughs> is it, is it, is it, I mean, are these clubs packed all the time? Oh, well, I'll call them clubs. So bathhouses, are they? Well, people packed? call them clubs too. Um, they it, like weekends are generally busy. It, again, it depends on what city you're in and if the bathhouse has a good reputation, yeah weekends are the busy time or if they have a special on during the week like we used to have a lucky at lunch special which used to get all the businessmen from the um, business district to come down and get off on their lunch hour and we used to have a tagline that used to say something like um, lucky at lunch if the girls at the office only knew that kind of thing so you just kind of make a bit of fun of it make it lighthearted for everyone but yeah, like um, weekends would be packed. There would be waiting lists to even get in or to get a rental room if you wanted. So that was just a lot to manage. It's an actual legal business. You pay taxes and everything. The tax man actually usually watches you a lot closer because you're making, there's so much cash involved. And so you're audited all the time and you have to make sure everything is to the cent. So it's just... So I'm assuming that the cash is to avoid people revealing their identities. Is this? Would yeah, they'll do that too. There's some people, I think, you know, as the years have gone on, like when I first started in the business in the early nineties or no late nineties, um, it was still a bit of a taboo. You just spoke about it between your friends and even your friends might divulge, not divulge if they've been. But by the time I ended 
uh, working in the industry for just over 10 years, it was like no longer a secret. People were like, oh yeah, I'm going to the baths on the weekend or whatever. It's, it's an alternative to going to the nightclubs and to the bars because usually there isn't liquor licenses in these places. So people will show up after the nightclubs. It's actually safe for, safer to um, meet somebody in those places because if something was to happen, uh, you know, dangerous or a theft or something, there is staff, you know, available to help you instead of bringing somebody home and they could rob you at home or who knows what, so. Well, you've only got a towel, so how can they rob you? <laughs> well, they will, believe me, there's, if they can get into a person's room and people sometimes don't lock their stuff up in a locker, oh, we have safe boxes where they can lock stuff, their wallets and stuff behind the front counter. But some people just were like, no, I'm fine, so. But how do you, I mean, this is a, Obviously, uh, now it, it's much more liberal and people have a more open view of uh, society yeah. about gay activity. Uh, but how do you control the criminal activity in and around, especially handling cash? That's always an attraction for our, you know, many well, classes. We used to have, we had three safest. In the first place I worked in, like, because I've managed three. So the first place I worked in, we had a safe in the manager's office, a drop safe, for the cashiers and then a safe in the floor and we would do bank deposits you know the next morning right away like 8 a.m or not whenever the banks open um and everything is recorded um and even by the time i ended there's video cameras at the entrance and stuff that used to people used to be so worried about that oh somebody's gonna recognize me but it wasn't beneficial for a club to release that kind of footage because then they would not get any business it was more for the safety of the patrons and also uh, the staff and it kept everybody kind of in line too because you could always review something back on a calendar or on a camera if there was an HR incident or something. But yeah, cash is always deposited right away. Um, there would be myself and say somebody else that would come with me to the bank or stuff like that. And the banks knew us very well too. So, yeah. So there's no a drinking involved because uh, the places aren't licensed. Yeah, it like in... It depends because every country is different and every place is different. So if they can get a liquor license, they'll get one. But that also adds uh, more stress on your work environment because then you're monitoring people who are drinking within your establishment and having open sex either in a room or right in front of you sometimes. So it's just more to handle. And it's that's its own business in itself. So to me, it was better without having liquor in there. If people would be drinking beforehand or whatever this way we if we thought they had too much we could just say come back later come back tomorrow because we don't want them to fall downstairs or slip in the shower or something like that in a bathhouse so even though we're insured like crazy but you just don't want any incidents happening you wanted a safe place and the last bathhouse i managed our capacity was 274 people wow that's yeah. good how yeah, many, I want to get busy. Pardon? How much of an area is that? How many floors? How many? It was two floors, um, 10,000 square feet. Wow. So it was quite large. And we had a whole DJ booth in there, like big jacuzzi. I, there was easily over 50 rooms of every size to rent. Wow. Uh, play areas, glory hole booths, everything. There's <laughs> slings, everything. So... Yeah. Wow. <laughs> what would be funny is you would have the place would be packed to capacity and somebody would walk up to the snap counter, towel counter and say, oh, there's nobody in here tonight. And it's like, there's 274 people in here. Like it just takes one. So <laughs> <laughs> just, but people, they're always, there's this whole sociology about all of this and the dynamics in a place. So if there was beautiful people in a place, people would be like, well, there's got to be somebody even better coming right around the corner, but yet sometimes not even looking in the own mirror to see what they have to offer. So it's always a bit of a game. It's, uh, you know, it's a fun atmosphere. It was the staff are always fun to work with and everything. Is it fun? Hard. Yeah, Is it's it a party atmosphere. Pardon? Is it actually fun? 
do people you know are, are pe yeah i always think of it, um, uh, these sort of things as being intense in some way and people being grim but obviously yeah, that's not the case there, there is that element to it too it depends right. if there's some major leather fetish and i think going on but Oh. You see, when you work in those places, you see every walk of life and like everybody doing whatever, people trying new things or scared of new things. There's been people that have come in for their first time mm. and just be in shock and turn around and run out practically. But then there's people that walk in and think it's the best place on earth that they've hit some kind of gay heaven. So um, mm. there was lots and you always had to watch because um, I believe that sexual addiction is a thing. And there was people that would show up, say they got lucky for the first time at six o'clock on a Monday night, they would start showing up, you know, at that same time, all the time. And if they had a bad night, they start to blame the club or whatever. It's like, you know, you're maybe here too much. And you can go through a lot of people if that's your choice. But we also promoted safe sex all the time. We gave away, we had bowls of free condoms. People would have to pay for their lubricant and stuff like that. But there was safe sex information on hand everywhere. We would have a health nurse come in once or twice a week and they could speak to them quietly about whatever. We would even give out flu shots, that kind of thing, if we could. And just even general health information, mental health too. How do you control the drug situation? Because that must be an issue. Yeah, you... Um, while well, the city I was living in was very known where drugs were just a normal part of, very normalized. So you're aware that people are gonna try to sneak in booze or drugs. And it's just part of, even though we had signs saying that you can be barred and we would bar people from those places, from the place if they were doing that kind of thing. But if they were stuck to themselves and they weren't trying to sell it or anything, and we would, right away, no, you get to know what somebody's gonna be up to and if they might be trouble. So we would just put word out amongst ourselves and monitor them. So if anything went wrong, we would just know what to do. I was very lucky that there was very few incidences where somebody was overdosing on GHB or something. So we had to have the ambulance come in and stuff. Um, but they were very professional and they'd come in and take care of it. And of course that person would wanna come back in the next day if they were okay, it's like, no, you're barred for quite a while. You need to sort out some stuff. So, so I, I'm taking it now that the authorities don't sort of, uh, that, that there was a tendency to always sideline uh, activities that go wrong in gay areas and stuff like that. I'm assuming now the authorities are more or less up to date and treat everybody respectfully. Yeah, they, they are very up to date. They're very, I've always found the authorities to be very, you know, on our side and very supportive and stuff like that. So they know that stuff is going to go on in a nightclub or whatever. And a bathhouse is like a nightclub in a sense. You can even dance in them. There's, you know, um, it's just it, people are mostly nude and having sex, <laughs> outwardly having sex. So, um, yeah. In a, in a sense, it's a very healthy environment because people aren't inhibited. Uh, often when people are inhibited, it, it it's not good for them. So I, you see, I it yeah, is. you see people generally relax. And once they come in and they changed into just a talent or, you know, walking around, looking around. Um, and again, you don't have to do anything. Our fitness, uh, like our gym part of the last club I worked in, we spent a hundred thousand year or dollars just on gym equipment. It was like state of the art. So people would come in there because it was almost like a cheaper gym membership and they could go have sex or sit in the steam room after. So where sex would happen too. So it's just, <laughs> it's a gathering place. It was a community place. There's word now, like since COVID that a lot of these places have shut down or are struggling, but I've seen a lot in say the UK where they've, you know, they've changed things up and they've made things because there's just so many options now for the gay community. Whereas before apps and the internet, everybody would just go to a gay bar or to a bathhouse or that kind of thing. So, yeah. But so, now apps. Let's talk about the main subject, of course, which is the book, because this is number two in the series. <laughs> and uh, and uh, why the book? 
Well, oh. I initially wrote the first one when everybody was in lockdown here in France. I wrote it near the end of lockdown because I was bored at home and I was just, I had kept diaries of all of my time. So I thought, and people had always told me, you know, at social events or whatever, you should write a book about, you know. So I just put some stories together and I wrote the book. But I feel I did it kind of very quickly and I promoted it literally when lockdown, when people, things were opening up again. It got a lot of media attention globally for a solid year, which I was happy about. But there was also something behind me that said, I know I could do better. And so I listened to feedback from my friends and from even strangers that bought the book. And they were all like, oh, we want more juicy stories. And could you give us more scandal? Or a lot of people were like, how did you get into that business? And how did you go from being in that business to living in the South of France? So I've included a lot more sex stories and a lot more scandal and basically answered their questions in roundabout ways. There's a lot more chapters now, but I wanted to, wanted it to be a final full release. So um, yeah, and already it's only been out since June and already, yeah, interviews are lined up again. So I don't know. It's an interesting subject for the gay community, I guess. So and I'm happy to help. I think it's important that these stories are told for the younger generation to see, because there was still a lot of illegal stuff, like even just hard to get a job being gay when I first started in this biz, that business. So I want them to know that there are stepping stones and what struggles people had to do to just even make a living type of thing. Have you, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot. Have you got a little snippet of a story you could relate to just quickly that would uh, titillate the palate of somebody who wanted to read the book? Uh, there's and lots. I mentioned like there's iconic New Year's Eve stories where a uh, baby was born at midnight on New Year's Eve, like a, a plastic doll. Basically, somebody shot it up. Beep! So, but oh, there's no. some really? Yeah. Uh, it was a surprise for everyone. It just said, uh, baby boy born at New Year's type of thing. So anyway, it's, but it's in the book. Um, there's a lot of stories. I changed, I had to change names for legal reasons and stuff. And um, there's just so much. Um, the owner of the first place I worked at, he had tried to have a lesbian night um, this was before I came along because there was pushed from the community. Oh, lesbians should have a place like this. So they had a one night thing, which kind of made the regular clients upset, but um, they set it up. They didn't do a lot of training for it. And it was a whole lesbian crew. They called it pussy palace for one night. And they thought, oh, maybe, you know, 20 women will show up or something. Well, apparently the lineup was down the block and into the venue to get inside. But because there was so little training, um, the they were just letting as many women in as possible, thinking making money, and it went over capacity. And plus, since this was the first time for a lot of women in these places, they didn't know what to expect either. They had snuck in booze and you know pot and stuff like that. Um, they ended up seeing their ex-wife or ex-partner or whatever, and so fights were starting. And it turned, they trashed the place basically. So the owner had to, he couldn't go to his insurance about this because he wasn't, it's, the business was set up as a private men's club only, which was a legal thing in the city at the time. So he couldn't say, oh, I've had only women. It's just a whole thing. So um, he had to pay for it. Whatever money they made had to go back into repairing the place. And they understood the situation. They wanted to try again another time. And he's like, no, 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 no. Because doors were broken in half. Mirrors were, you know, uh, broken. Just everything. Like, it just got crazy. So he was like, lesson learned. So I think things have changed now. Because even when I left, um, we would have uh, kind of meetings for the LGBT community because we had a kind of open meeting room at part of the bathhouse where the mental health nurse could, or the health nurse in general, just would um, talk to people from the transgender community, lesbian and gay if they wanted to all sit in and just have questions, general questions answered or see how they can strengthen the community. So things have had come a long way and that was I had only been doing it for just over 10 years. So, and just in that span of time. So it was very good. 
That's excellent. Uh, sort of going on. So down here in the Riviera, can somebody uh, sample the bathhouse experience? Yes, there's um, one only one bathhouse in the region. It's like a, a technical bathhouse. It's called La Bandouche in Nice. Um, it's near, uh, like, it's in the center of Nice. It's very easy to find. It's a, these buildings are usually nondescript with not, no signage or whatever. But if you go to even my blog, Gay French Riviera, I've written an article about it years ago. So the information is all there. Or you can just, you know, Google it online. There are a lot of cruising bars in Nice, um, which are similar to bathhouses. They don't have, like, say, the jacuzzi and stuff like that. But they are also, they're smaller, but they are gathering places for gay, bisexual, straight men, too. So there's actually quite a number of them for a city the size of Nice. So, and they do quite well. So, so uh, well, we're coming to the end of our time. So I'm, I'm going to tell people to look out for, uh, we're going to Bathhouse Babylon mm -hmm. for release by Jameson Farn. Uh, do look it up because I think it'll be an excellent. Well, I've read a few pages and <laughs> I haven't read it all because I'm too innocent. And I just I I started the book off with a bang. So, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's like it's um, I call it the second coming. And it's oh, like, God. <laughs> so it's like, um, but, but yeah, it's found I, out. You can find it on Amazon right now. And it's a uh, Jameson has a lovely writing style. I mean, he's a, well, you can tell a very engaging individual. So I encourage oh anybody listening to this to go along and uh, read this book it i think you'll find it entertaining if, yes. <laughs> if it does make your face go red like it does it mine <laughs> don't answer questions <laughs> anyway i just i now i have to say uh well thank you so much uh james i really really enjoyed our conversations I always do uh riveting and we could go on for hours but i'm not allowed yeah. to <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, thank, thank you so much. much. I really so, appreciate it. Yeah. So I hope to see you very soon, Jameson. Yes, you too. You too. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. huge smiles as usual while I found the off button. <laughs> <laughs>